need a little bit of inspiration when it comes to reading and writing. So let's quickly see who's here. It's finally here. It's Dicey, uh, Waputro. Hi, everyone. Soy. Uh, Dila, where are you guys from? Let, uh, put it in the comments below. I love reading your comments. As I'm going to go through today's lecture, um, uh, if you have any questions, but just put them in the comments and I'll try and get to it throughout this Sorry, live stream. Sorry, I think uh, it's not recording at all. It's not recording? It's working? Hi. It's working. Okay. Um, okay, let's continue. Yeah, it's uh, Ecuador. Hi, Dilla. It's so nice to have you here. Um, what about the rest of you guys? Louise, nice to see you. Maida and Carolina. Hi, everyone. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to start with um, the presentation. I'm going to try and give you a lot of tips and ideas that you can use in your class. I think it's very important to be practical. You know, it's, it's, it's fine for us as teachers to learn about, you know, to, to learn the research and to, uh, but we need more practical tips. That's what a lot of teachers have been telling me. So that's what I'll try to do. Jose, yeah, nice to see you too. Uh, I'm so happy to be back here. Okay, everyone, let's get started with today's presentation. Okay, so as you can see, it's integrate reading and writing. And let me show you what I will talk about today. So first I will do a very quick introduction. Then I'm going to give you some games and activities that you can spend, uh, that you can do with reading. Like I said before, many ESL teachers need more tips and games that they can use with reading and writing because we spend so much time focused on speaking, but we should also fo look at the other skills too. Then, so first I'm going to do reading games and activities. Second, I'm going to show you a fantastic book series called Integrate Reading and Writing, which actually focuses on reading and writing. And I'll show you how that book series work, uh, works. And then finally, to cap it off, I'm going to show you some writing games and activities. Because I know, you know, as teachers, you know, so sometimes we have weak spots or blind spots or some weaknesses to our teaching that we want to improve. So uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions, if there's something that you would like an opinion on, please put it in the comments and I'll try to answer as best I can. Okay. Everyone, let's get started with the intro introduction. Okay, so um, that guy right there, that's, uh, that's me, that's uh, Eric Wesch. Um, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for almost 15 years. Uh, I've taught all different levels. So I've got quite a lot of experience, uh, and uh, I hope to share some of that with you. Uh, and then I'm also a YouTuber. My YouTube channel is called Etiquette. I focus on helping teachers, sharing um, resources, and talking about how to teach. So you can check that out. I'm also a Compass Publishing speaker. I think this is my fourth or fifth presentation. Hopefully, I'm improving. I hope so. And uh, if you can give me any tips or advice, things that you would like to see, that will help me to improve too. Because nobody is perfect. I'm far from perfect. And that's why if you can help me grow as a speaker, I would really appreciate that. Okay, uh, from Bolivia. Hi, Nelson. Good to see you. Mercy and Robert. Hi. Okay, good to see you all. Okay, let's go into the reading activities. Just look at this. You know what? There's been a lot of research to show us how important and valuable reading is for learners. The more learners read, uh, the better they become and the more successful they are. You can look at the top CEOs in the world. How many books do they read compared to normal people? And we should instill this love for, te for reading in our students from a very early age. In my classes, when I was teaching, you know, we would do activities and one of my rules was that if you are not busy with an activity or you're busy with homework, you take out a book and read. And I think, you know, the students were much happier and it always kept them busy. I think it's very important for us as teachers to instill that passion for reading in our learners. Now, I'm going to share 10 reading games and activities that you can use in your class. Because many teachers say, Eric, isn't it just open up a book, tell the students to read and then ask them questions about it? Yes, but you can make it fun and interesting reading in class. Now, when we look at reading, 
Um, there are three phases that we're looking at. Pre-reading, while reading, and post-reading. Pre-reading is how do you mentally prepare your students for what they're about to read. So you can show them a picture, you can show them a video, um, you can ask them uh, what their prior knowledge is of the topic. Right? You can ask them questions related with the topic, what they're going to learn, to help them understand what they're about to read. I mean, one of the worst things I think that a lot of teachers do is they just expect this, they want to surprise their students with the content. And that's a big mistake. Hi, Karen from Peru. Karen, good to see you. And Angie from Mexico. Yeah, guys, if you have any questions, put it in between. I'm jumping um, between the topics. Yeah, so pre-reading, we have to prepare our students for success. While reading is some activities that we can do while reading. So while the students are reading, check their knowledge. If there is some vocabulary, ask them some, some questions about the vocabulary. Um, ask them what the, sometimes I ask my students what the translation is for a word. Because a lot of students, uh, maybe they're a bit shy, they don't want to ask our teacher, I don't know this word. So if there is a word or an expression, I say, oh, does anybody know what this is in Korean or, you know, in, in uh, Spanish or whatever your language might be so that the students in the back that don't really know, they pick it up. And then post-reading. Post-reading, that is where we see how much our students understood. And it's very important to make sure. I think for us as teachers, you know, for me too, sometimes we give our students instructions or we read something and we think our students understand but then they don't. Think about yourself. If you are in a meeting with all the teachers and the principal says, does everybody understand? You say, yes, because you know, you're a bit shy to ask. And then later you ask your, the other teachers, what did that mean? And it's the same with our students. We should make sure they understood everything that they read before. Uh, Maribel, very nice to see you. And Alex from Sri Lanka too. Very nice guys. Okay. Now, let me tell you a really fun game that you can play. It's called the Tarantino and the Spoiler. Do you know who Quentin Tarantino is? He's a filmmaker with very violent movies, but something interesting about Quentin Tarantino is that he shoots his movies in different order. Um, a famous movie of that is Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, where the story is scrambled. And you can do the same with your students. Let's say you have a story like we have here. Um, uh, he's over here. This is Arthur. And so the first um, story that we see, this first part over here, says his work, hard work really paid off. He won. Hmm. So you're starting basically with the end. You're scrambling. So what you can do is you take a story and you cut it up and you mix it. You start reading the end. Or, uh, well, if you've got your story, you start reading the end and then you can read the middle and then you can read the start. And it makes it interesting for the students to start to kind of figure out the story structure. So we see here his hard work really uh, paid off. Uh, he won. Arthur was nervous to be in the spelling bee, so he studied hard to be prepared. So then you ask your students, what is the correct order? How should it happen? And the spoiler, what is the spoiler? That is where you read the ending first and then you ask your students, what led up to it? How did we get to this ending? What can you expect? And it makes the students think. This is a really fun activity to get the students' uh, brains working. You know, uh, from Mexico too. Hi, Denise. Um, okay, then the second one is called reading race. Now this is a, is a great one. This is where you put students into different teams and they, they sit in a circle and they want to read the story. Let's say one sentence at a time. One student finishes a sentence, then it's the next one, the next one, the next one. As you know, we like these games that are very competitive. So get the students, uh, it doesn't have to be in groups, it can be one giant group, let the students sit in a circle, and then you can time them, or you can play music while they go around and try and read. It's a, it's a really fun way, and I think, you know, students love reading out loud. And we can also inspire them to use different voices and to change their, vo um, their tone, to, to change the speed. And by making it a reading race, it's really fun for them to work on their fluency, their fluency. Okay, everybody's still good. I'm going through this. 
The next one, cut into pieces. Um, you take a story, you cut it into pieces, you distribute it to different students, uh, to a group. Each student reads a, uh, their part and then they have to figure out how the story works. Uh, another fun way to do it is you combine a reading race with pieces. You cut a story into pieces, put it against the wall, and then the students have to run, read it, come back, and they have to try and uh, fix the story. I think this is a great one because this is where the students collaborate and work together with their reading. It's way more fun than just sitting there and reading the story and asking them. So make your stories a bit more exciting, especially imagine if you are doing a reading lesson and your principal came in or some parents came in to observe you and you're just reading there and it's super boring. But if you take that same concept and you make it fun, your principal comes in and says, well, Sandra, that is fantastic. You're such a good teacher. So use these tips, make teaching fun. Okay, number five, uh, scrambled sentences. You know what this is. Everybody's used it, used it before. You take a sentence, you scramble it, and you ask the students to put it back together. This is a, a golden oldie. Yandri, I bet you've used the uh, scrambled sentences before. So dog likes the two Okay, I think this is a bit shorter. It should be said, the, do the dog likes to sit. Um, so here is my red hat. So the students are learning, uh, you know, the structure of sentences. This is very good for our younger learners. And it's even applicable to older students too, where you can give them longer sentences and they understand where the adjectives and the adverbs and the nouns, where everything goes. And it's also very useful for time words to understand where the time words go. Okay, everyone, if you've got any questions, put it in the comments. I'm uh, just drinking from my tiny little uh, water here. It's very cute. I love it. Hmm. You know, I feel like a tomato and you've got to water your tomatoes, I think. Okay, number six, misspelled words. Uh, this is really good. You know, sometimes uh, I make mistakes on purpose. So let's say I write on the board, I write a sentence and I make some obvious mistakes. Sometimes I want the students to help correct me because it serves two purposes. Number one, they are seeing some of the common mistakes that they make and immediately a lot of the students will think, oh, okay, I see the teacher made that mistake. I should fix it in the future. So you can see here tomorrow or coming and they can start think, oh, okay, this, uh, these are some of the common mistakes. And the second thing that it does is it actually it gives your students confidence because if they see that you are making mistakes, hmm, wow, you know what? If the teacher can make a mistake, I don't have to feel bad about making mistakes. Do you guys understand that? I think that's so important, you know, to give the best to our students, um, you know, we should try it out. Saying goodly instead of well, very, yeah, that's something, that's a pet peeve of mine is um, not just goodly, but, you know, using good and well in a different way. You know, when I was young, I was taught that if you, if you do an action, you, uh, if, if it's an action, you do something well, but something is good. But these days, you know, uh, a lot of people, especially native speakers in England and America, they just say, you know, you did good, you did good, which is actually a mistake, but language is constantly evolving, but goodly, yeah, that's not gonna work. It makes teachers more humane. Marivelle, that's brilliant, you know? Um, I think as teachers, you know, there is a certain aura. We, we should have confidence and we are almost like heroes to students, but it does make us more humane so they can relate to us. I think that's very important. Great, great point. Thank you so much. Okay, so using misspelled words is a great way for the students to read. So um, make some mistakes when you do it and ask the students to fix it. Okay, now role play. Um, so role play, we can see all these people standing here with their silhouette. Um, thank you, Floor. It is very interesting. Yes, I think so. Um, role play. Everybody knows role play. This is one of the foundations of teaching English. We want the, to put the students into situations where, you know, we are mimicking uh, real life situations so that they can practice. And it's the same for books. Uh, when the students are reading, ask them to take on certain characters. They are certain characters from the book. What would they say? Or if they're reading a book or if they're reading a story, let them act out scenes. Say, okay, here's the scene that happened. 
Now I want you to, to do it, but I want you to do it using your own words. You know, then they're more relaxed and they understand how it works. If they're reading, while they're reading, ask them to use different voices to be different characters. Who's the narrator? Who's this character? So really make the students part of the story. I think that is very important. When students feel included, they feel like they're really enjoying it. Um, another one that you can do is you can do a debate. You know, let's say you've got some elements in a story and you say, okay guys, how do you feel um, about it? Uh, one of the questions is, can I share this webinar in Facebook? Um, I'm going to guess and just say yes, guys. If you want to share this webinar with other teachers, please go ahead and invite them to the channel because you know when we share these ideas, we are improving as teachers and later we can talk to our friends about it and talk about these ideas. Uh, Abdur Rahim, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Okay, so uh, debate and role play, very important to make your students part of the reading process. Um, I think, you know, if they are on the outside, it's not real to them. But once you connect the students to what they're reading, they will internalize it much better. Nancy, hi, thank you for being so kind and saying hello to everyone. Now, this is something that the students hate, but they actually love. Read a story and before the end, tell them to close their books or to to stop reading. Everybody, turn over the page. No more reading. Because, you know, sometimes students get so invested in reading and then you tell them to stop. They're so curious. Teacher, what is the ending? I need to know. And you say, wait, wait, wait. Not so fast. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? And you'll see the student's hand shoot up because they're now suddenly they're invested in the story and they're curious. And you can ask them, oh, what do you think is going to happen? And ask him some questions, you know, and you'll get a lot of different answers. Which brings me to the next one. Alternate ending. Listen, um, if students are reading, they are presented with, if it's fiction or non-fiction, they are presented with information. But we all know the thing is with information is that they can use it and change it. So ask the students to change the information in the story. It can be in a story in non-fiction. If they are reading about um, a, a different country, ask them, okay, if you could change something about that country, what, how would you change the information? You're, if they're reading about an animal, you can say, okay, if, if an, uh, how would you change this animal? How would you change the information? And it makes them think. You know, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, diff a different level of uh, thinking that we want. It's critical thinking that we want to promote. So don't, uh, don't be passive in reading is what I want to tell you. Uh, I mean, a lot of teachers think, okay, just read the information, it will go in. No, let them interact and mold the information to make it interesting and to form those connections. Okay, everybody good? If you've got any questions, put it in the comments. I'd love to read it. Okay, number 10, this is the last one with reading. Make a sentence. Um, this is very similar to the last one. If there are, If there is new vocabulary, um, or students are reading an expression, ask them to use it in their own sentence. So change it up. Uh, Robert, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, if you have any uh, tips of your own or if you have any ideas, put them in the comments. You know what? Um, I really appreciate all the teachers that are here trying to improve and learn and become better. Because you know what? I feel as teachers, there's so much information out there but it's just about sharing and learning from each other. So, you know what? I'm also here. I'm learning from you guys. Uh, uh, Jong-un, hi. Yeah, uh, and just sharing ideas. So, now this is reading activities. Uh, those are 10. I'm sure there are many other activities out there and games that you can use. I hope you can use these. Okay, now, um, any questions so far? I'm going to move on to... Um, number two, so like I told you before, there are three things that we're talking about. The first one, reading games that I just finished. Uh, um, number two, we're going to talk about a very good book called Integrate Reading and Writing from uh, Compass Publishing that I highly recommend. And then finally, I'm going to give you some writing games and activities. Okay, is everyone ready? Need to, need to drink, okay. Now, let's get stuck into integrate, 
reading and writing. Now, what is this series all about? As you can see, here are eight books. They're very colorful, very beautiful books. Um, you can see some animals, some planes, some events, uh, some history. Uh, I don't know if you can see this very well at building level number two. Uh, this is a moving rock. It's uh, you know, it was a bit of a mystery where um, these rocks moved in the desert and nobody knew why. You know, there, there's some theory. So we know that's about science. And we've got a snowflake here and a boat. So basically, what is this integrate series? It is where we integrate different subjects with learning English. And you know how important this is. Your principal or your uh, at school or your, your government, you know, when you talk about uh, the to the Department of Education, they are always telling teachers, how can you integrate different subjects within your lessons? So um, this is a great way for us. The series is a, a way for us to integrate different subjects with learning English. And I'm going to go through these books so you exactly know what can happen. And also, even if you don't use this book series, maybe you can use some of these ideas in your class. So don't go away. Um, even if you're not interested in the book series, watch this and maybe you can use some of these ideas in your class. Okay, is everybody good? Let's get into it. So the general con uh, concept integrate is multi-level reading and writing series. It's for beginners to intermediates. Um, it has a variety of formats. What is a variety of formats? That's uh, you know magazine articles. If it's uh, you know it looks like it's a website. If it's a letter. If it's a postcard. Um, you know. Uh, students need to get used to all these formats. You know, it's so heartbreaking. Um, you know, once, uh, because I teach university students now, and many of them come to me and it's like, Eric, how do you write a letter? Or how do you write a good email? Where they have never learned about this. And it's our duty as teachers to prepare our students for, for adulthood, right? So we have to make sure that our students are able to use these different formats. And that's what's so great about Integrate Reading. Okay, familiar, uh, familiarity with reading skills. Reinforced. Oh, I like that word, reinforced, with writing tasks. So we've got the input. The input is uh, reading and learning new vocabulary vocabulary, um, learning about other subjects, reading different formats, and then the output is they're going to write, you know, because they need an input and an output. Uh, reading comprehension is progressively developed in tandem with fluency. So the better they are at reading, the, the more they're going to do. Okay, Robert says, uh, with English you not only integrate um, but also culture. Definitely, Robert. It's not only subjects, but uh, it's actually one of the points. Robert, I think you're psychic because one of the points that uh, I'm actually going to talk about is how learning a language is also about culture and how we actually take in a language. So I'm going to talk about that later. Um, yeah, so students learn vocabulary and there is also, with this book series, it also has AR, augmented reality, and engaging videos. So it's not just about reading. They also have a lot of, uh, a lot of this is on computer, it's on mobile, because, you know, right now, you have to understand that this is the future using online uh, students learning remotely. This is the future of education. Yes, classrooms will always be there. But the best thing for you is to take this content from just normal books and be able to put it on the computer. Okay, because right now a lot of us have to teach online or remotely. Okay, now. This is what it looks like. You can see this is the student book and the practice book. Um, and this is the teacher's guide. It's got rubrics. It helps teacher development. Uh, when, when a young or new teacher takes this book, they can really learn how to utilize it in their classes. And then, like I told you before, there's a mobile app and it's for desktop. Additionally, there are some midterm and final exams, some work, uh, writing worksheets and listening worksheets. Okay, so this series is geared towards teachers. It helps us as teachers to teach the topic and it also helps students to learn from it. Uh, Carolina, hi, and George. Uh, I hope it's George. I know maybe I'm saying it wrong. George, I'm sorry if I say it wrong. Um, excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, now, this is what the book looks like. Um, 
I'm going to go a little bit quicker because you know what, there's so much I want to say, that's why I'm speaking quickly. Um, so this is what it looks like. As you can see here on the side, it says social studies, that's for two units. Um, and then it's got science, it's got maths, and then a special subject. And that's going to integrate it with English. And down here at the bottom, I know it's very small, but it's basically, after each two units, there's a review um, activity or project. For example, the, this first one is a job report. The second one is an animal postcard. So, uh, this, it gives the students a chance to reflect on the work they've already done. Listen, as teachers, uh, I said before, you know, we have to make sure that our students understand the content that we're doing with them. And so a great way to do that is by reviewing, you know, and it helps students actually, you know, um, make sure that they learn everything. There's a word I forgot um, about learning everything. But anyway, let's continue. Okay, this is the unit structure. You'll see here's the structure. It's called ecosystems. The first lesson is for reading, that's where they're going to read, that's where they get activities for um, their vocabulary and reading about it, um, also working on the grammar. And then the, the second lesson B, that's more geared towards writing activities. So you've got your um, input and you've got your output. Okay, now uh, this is what I said before, we've got our receptive skills, that's our input, so that is listening and reading. Then when we want the students to produce, to practice what they've been learning, um, that is where they're going to speak and write. So listening comes in, speaking comes out. Reading comes in, writing comes out. Okay, um, uh, Marival says, teaching English or any language uh, integration is key. Uh, yeah, inter integration is so important. Okay, and that brings us, I'm just going back, this brings us to the next spot. Um, Content language integrated learning. So this is basically where we say we've got to take our core skills, our core subjects, and we've got to integrate them with each other. For example, life and career skills, um, learning innovation, the four C's that we talked about before, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity, and also information and media skills. And then we integrate all of those also with our core subjects and the three R's. What are the three R's? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. So it's uh, all these should be the foundation for every student. And we should, as even if we're language teachers, even if we're math, math teachers, we should try and use all these different subjects and skills to help our students develop, you know, um, uh, not just in one particular area, because many times students come out and they say, oh, teacher, I can only study math, or teacher, I'm only good at biology. By integrating these different subjects, they can feel that, oh, I can learn anything and I'm improving as a student. Right, so I'd rather have a student that is really good at everything, you know, instead of one student that is amazing at one subject, but they don't feel very confident in other topics. You guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay, let's continue. This is what we said before. Uh, we have to integrate our content with our language. So whatever you're teaching, whatever topic, um, you should tr find a way to explain and use language in there. You know, you can be teaching any topic um, or any subject, and then you find out, okay, how can we teach the students about the language that's inside there? Okay, if you're st teaching, um, you know, chemistry or something, go into the language. You know, how do you talk about these variables, and how do you talk about everything? How can you use English in there? Okay, so it's dual focus, but content drives language. Okay, now here we can see, I want to show this to you. So, for example, this is a topic area science, and you can see this is exactly laid out for you. When you have to do lesson planning, you have to look at these things and this helps. So, first we have the content related things, the, the topic, it tells you exactly what the topic is, the academic objective, the reading format, what they'll be reading, and then also we have the language related. Um, so, they're going to learn modal verbs, the vocabulary we'll be looking at, what reading skill do we want to practice, what writing skill, cause and effect. That's a very important skill. And then integrate IT. There's a QR code that students can learn to use. So students are, are learning about the subject. Um, they're learning English language skills too. And we're integrating some IT. Wow, this is, you know, covering everything. Marival, thank you so much. Yeah. Now, this is a unit walkthrough. So first, if 
and this is you can use this with any lesson, not just with here. Uh, when you start your lesson, any lesson, you start by activating prior knowledge. So you students go and they find out, oh, what do they already know about this subject? How can you connect this subject to their uh, previous knowledge? You know, their prior knowledge. Then uh, use the reading skills. So first we have you talk about it. There are some questions. Uh, then there are some reading skills that you're going to practice. Then you check comprehension. There are some activities to check that they understand what they've been reading. Then you check the vocabulary. And then there is some reading fluency development and they're also going to practice some writing skills. And this is the same for any topic that you're going to do. You start off, find out what they know and then they start with the input, what are they reading and then you check their skills, you check their, um, their knowledge, that they understand everything and now they're going to use that knowledge that they have to produce something. Okay, everybody still here? If you have any questions, put it in the content below. Uh, here, okay, here, we can, here we go, you can see here, so a very interesting picture, so you can ask your students, oh, what do you see? What is it? And then um, here are some questions, what do you see in this picture? Where does it come from? What does it mean? So the students become invested and they, they become interested in the topic. Okay, so here we say background knowledge and you provide a, stimul a stimulus. This is very important. You know, um, the best teachers, when you start a lesson, you have to get the student's attention. And that's through a stimulus by showing a map, a video clip. So the students scan the picture, you ask them questions. You can even put the students into groups to discuss it. Have them share their thoughts. This is uh, what, uh, who said this before? Uh, I think it was Robert. Robert, this is what I wanted to talk about. Language and culture. Language is more than just the code. It involves social practices. When you study a language, it's going to be different all around the world and we have to consider the culture. Uh, the way you teach languages is a reflection of your own understanding and your own principles. So it's very important for teachers to take our cultures and make it part of the language. There's a very strong connection between it. Okay, and uh, uh, this is, and also in the way that we teach, we should consider the culture of our students too to really get it. Uh, Soy says, uh, hey Eric, what are these series for young adults? Uh, yeah, it's for beginners to intermediate, I would say. So um, not very beginner, not, I would say, you know, um, you know um, uh, elementary school into middle and high school, I would say. Yeah, um, all those tips are very nice. Thanks a lot. Maria, I appreciate it. You know, um, uh, sometimes I think I talk too much, but uh, I'll be so happy. Even if there's one or two ideas that you take from this, I'd be very happy. Okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I still want to get to the writing activities. I've got about 15 minutes left, um, then I'll stop and you can have a quick break before John gets here. Okay? Okay, guys, I'm going through very quickly. Nobody complain that I'm going through quickly because I want to share everything with you. Okay? Okay, hold on to your seats, this is going to be quick. Okay, uh, like I said before, um, the first lesson is based on input. Um, uh, so they're reading and they're learning about it. There's a lot of vocabulary based on the sources and it's uh, relevant to the context of the unit. Uh, Floor Flo says it's very important to know other cultures too. Right, you know, um, uh, these days the world, uh, the world is connected, you know. Um, people are traveling, people are communicating with each other and we have to understand each other's culture. And you know what, if you go into different cultures, you also learn about yourself and you improve as a person too. I've learned so much through traveling and interacting with people from other cultures. So very good tip. Okay, uh, then we see the vocabulary is tiered. So you get tier one is like everyday words that the students learn. Then there's high utility words that they can use, um, uh, especially in uh, class. And then they've got uh, tier three, which is very specific um, for a subject. Okay, so that's where we use this content and we use it with the language. Okay, uh, language, there's a lot of grammar in here. As you can see, we're going to focus on grammar. They're going to learn about it too. Um, 
And it's also an emphasis on demonstrating the use of the structures. Instead of just reading it, they get to use it in the book. Okay, like you can see here, learning language, using language. Okay, this is what it looks like. See, it looks so nice and pretty. Um, all the vocabulary is highlighted, lots of interesting uh, um, photos that we can learn from. Um, then the passage format, I told you about it before, very important for, uh, for students, not to just to learn one away, they can use email, um, messages, recipes, blogs, website, magazines, traditional forms, and letters. It's very important to um, you know, uh, show our students all these different formats so that they can learn. Uh, okay, reading comprehension skills, they're going to learn, um, there are lots of activities to show their skills. Uh, there's a practice book, so even if they go home, you can give them some things to practice, and it's really fun, it's not boring, they can use it too. Um, uh, a lot of people say, should we be giving homework to students? I think if it's easy and it's fun and the students can learn from it, then it's fine. That's my personal opinion. Okay, the emphasis is on output. Right, we want the students to read, but the output is very important. How can they write it? It doesn't matter if someone can listen to you, but they can't speak or they can't communicate back to you. Um, so it's very important to focus on that output. I think a lot of students, they get very shy, but we should give them a chance to not to be shy and to speak or to write and communicate with other people. I think it's very important to tell to, to use the language and explore the content. Okay, um, like I said before, they're also going to understand cultures here and they learn about uh, using the vocabulary for the culture. We said that before. Hello Anne, it's so nice to see you. Uh, writing skills, so they're going to develop writing skills too. They start off at the basics and it gets progressively more uh, interesting for them. So it's very easy, they get used to it, and they can start writing their own words. As you can see, it gets um, progressively, not more difficult, I would say more interesting. Uh, fluency is very important. Like you can see in here, there's a writing plan. So first we give them the plan, and then they have to use that same plan to write their own thing. And they can feel themselves, themselves become more confident. Okay, I'm going because, okay, like I said before, there are lots of um, AR and IT skills that they're going to learn. Very interesting. Um, for example, let me show you this. We're almost done here. Um, very useful things. So, you know, students and adults, we're using um, media more and more and more. And look at this graph. It says here, so people are sleeping and when students wake up, this is what they're doing. They're either playing games, they're on their cell phones. I think... You know, it's, I, I, was, I was on the train yesterday and I thought, man, everybody's on their phones just, you know, consuming, you know, thinking of things. So, um, yeah, uh, we have to learn how to read and think about how our students con uh, is starting to consume uh, information. And this is very important. You can see even at breakfast and then they go to school and it kind of falls down and then it rises during break, school, and then after school we see how much media they are actually taking in. And as teachers, it is our responsibility to think about um, what our students are doing and how can we as teachers reach them. And by using, uh, by integrating, you know, English with interesting topics and also with technology and IT, we are going to reach more of our students. Hi, Asumadin, nice to see you again. Um, uh, welcome. We are going, you're actually in time, we're going to a very interesting place now. So you can see here, um, even in the US, how, how much time do students spend uh, on digital um, devices? And it's only going to become more. So we should start thinking about that and how we as teachers can reach our students. More than 10 hours, 30%, wow. And 30%, six to nine hours, 30%, three to five hours. Imagine when you were young, how much time did you spend in front of a TV? Maybe at night when you come back, you would watch TV or you would play computer games, but now, Students, uh, even during school time, a lot of them are spending time on it. And we have to reach these students. Guys, let me be honest with you. 
it's going to become more difficult to reach our students because, you know, they've got all these different devices to look at, uh, their phones, um, their TVs, their computers. They're constantly around these devices. And it, for us as teachers, we need to break through and reach them. And it's going to become more and more difficult for us to reach our students. So we've got to learn new skills and we've got to learn how we as teachers can connect with our students and get their attention. It's a fight for attention. A lot of people say that each generation has their war. There was World War I. There was World War II. Um, now, our generation is the war for attention. Write that down. Our war as teachers and as people is the war for attention. How can we stay focused on something? Very important. Now, uh, yeah, mobile devices is becoming the norm for content delivery. We as teachers, we need to adapt. Teaching is changing very quickly, you know, and we can complain about it. We can say, oh, I, I don't know if I can do online. I don't know if I can, uh, can use mobile devices. You know, I want to go back to all reading and, uh, and listening to the teacher. No, guys. I'm sorry, we have to adapt. Just uh, accept it and move on. Be the best teacher you can be. So here we say the consequences, you know, we have to start showing them how to think critically and also develop their IT skills and our, our, our own skills as well. Okay, yeah, we can see this book is fantastic because it does a lot of that work for us anyway. Uh, okay, I'm just going through this. You can see um, there's a lot of uh, creativity. And this is what we want. Uh, so when s retention rates after 24 hours, a lecture, they retain it for 5% of the time, reading 10%, audio visual 20. If, you can, if they can demonstrate it 20, 30%, discussions in groups. This, this is why we got to get our students talking to each other. 50% practice by doing. So if they're role playing and talking, the 75%. And then if they start teaching others, it's 90%. One of my favorite things that I like to do is that I like the students to teach other students when we are reviewing things. Okay, um, guys, this has been the Integrate Reading Series and Writing. Check it out if you want it. It's uh, on Compass Publishing's website. Check it out. Now, writing activities. I've got five minutes left. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, if you have an urgent question, please put it in, in the uh, comments and I'll try and get to it. Writing should be fun. I'm going to share some activities. The first one, show yourself to the students. Use some of your story, uh, show the students a photo of yourself. This is me. Um, ask them, what do you see? Write a story. What do you think is happening in this? So the stu students really get invested because they can see their teacher and they can write a story about it. Uh, the students can use their own photos too. You know, this is just a photo but it is, um, it's a stimulus for them to get some inspiration to start writing. They really have a fun time. And if you put yourself as the teacher in front of them, they can have so much fun and they can build a relationship with you. Okay, yeah, that's me on the right and that's my friend. If you don't know, this is, was for Halloween. So yeah, you can get to know me a little bit better too and that's the same for your students. Next one, change the view. So ask the students to write a story and say that they are a food, like your sandwich or your food. What is happening around you? Who's going to eat you? How do you feel? Hi, Usama from Egypt. Nice to see you. So you can ask the students to change their perception and their view about things. Okay, next one. Make a rap. Okay, this is where the students can write a poem. This is really fun. You know, Shakespeare and uh, Eminem, you know, all these guys, they are using language in a creative way. And we should try and get our students to do it way too. Uh, Murray Val, yeah, that's a nice way to introduce yourself. Yolanda, good to see you. Um, okay, so make it a rap or poem. Dip, dip, dip. Did you ever lick a lollipop stick? Dipped it into mustard. Did it make it stick? Yeah, have fun with the language. You know, language is not supposed to be boring. We should inspire our students to be creative and have fun with the language. So let them write interesting stories. Uh, next one, music speed writing. 
If you give too much time to your students, they're going to play around, they're going to get bored. So instead of that, tell them, okay, I'm going to play a song, it's three minutes long, you find a fun pop song that they love and say, you've got this song to write a story and you just see them writing. You know, it's like when you've got um, work to do, let's say you've got an assignment or there's something that you have to do and if there's a deadline, suddenly you start working hard. So let's say you've got a week to do a project and then the week you kind of procrastinate and then the night before you're just working very hard and it's the same with this, you know, if you tell them to do something quickly they will uh, find the, the, uh, the inspiration. Okay, so speed writing, very fun. The next one, animal story. Ask the students to pick an animal. This is very similar to the food story. Um, tell, tell a story about an animal. What is your dog doing during the day? Your bird, tell an exciting story about your bird. And this is great because you can make it fiction or non-fiction. If it's non-fiction, you know, they can make a report. If it's fiction, they can create an interesting story. Uh, my dog is actually a spy. You know, they can build it up. Guys, um, language is meant to be creative. You know, sometimes when you give students a topic and one of them just writes a, a fantastic story, it makes you so happy. Now, it's up to you as a teacher to draw that inspiration and that creativity out of them. Okay, the next one, uh, treasure hunt, write random words. So ask the students to write random words, any words. Then they take the words, they fold them up, put them into a box and the students have to pick words. With those words, they have to construct a story. So that's another way to get them. Um, it doesn't have to be about pirates. I mean, they can write down any words and then they take the words and they write a completely new story with it. Great idea? I think so. Okay, the next one, story train. I hope you've done this one before, three minutes left. Um, so story train, what happens with story train is you put students into a circle, um, let them start by writing a story, say stop, everybody passes the paper on, they read and they continue the story. I've seen some fantastic stories come out of this. Try not to make it too long because then they have to, because they have to read more and more and more and more, you know, uh, but that's so good. So make sure they have a beginning, middle and end. That's another thing I want to mention to you. Um, structure is very important important. Make sure to teach your students structure. If it's in speeches, if it's in writing, make sure they understand the structure. Introduction, uh, body, conclusion. Okay. Um, next one, uh, reports. I was talking about this before. Um, take a big event, take something in their lives, you know, what is happening, let them write a report on it. Recently, I had a really funny um, uh, photo I shared on my Facebook where it said, uh, in the world right now, there's an English teacher waiting to give the students an assignment. What did I do this during coronavirus? Okay, so that's, that's, that was kind of funny. So uh, let the students write reports uh, of real events or their lives. Okay, everyone almost finished. I think this is the last one, movie clip. Okay, show the students a movie clip and then tell the students to write a dialogue. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So there can be characters doing something and then the students write it. Or you can show a movie clip, stop it and ask them, okay, what's going to happen next? So they've got the characters, they've got the setting, and now um, with the imagination, they can write something new. <sighs> okay, guys, I think I made it. Okay, what did you think? Uh, any good ideas? Did you enjoy it? Do you have any questions? I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then I'm going to say goodbye. Yeah, um, guys, thank you so much for, for being here. I know um, I talk a lot and I look like a tomato. I might need to get a haircut soon too, but um, I hope you uh, learn something from this. Um, and uh, um, Robert said, Eric, thank you. The capacity, uh, attention, listening and learning from you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, I'm going to use these ideas. Yeah, guys, and by the way, um, I know I went very quickly. If you want to watch this again, um, this uh, webinar will be replayed on the YouTube channel. Okay, because I know I went very quickly. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate all of you. If you have any questions, uh, put it in there.
John is coming next. He knows what he's doing. Uh, please uh, take a short break. Get yourself a tea. Come back to watch John afterwards. Everyone, have a blessed weekend. Uh, I'm Eric, and uh, uh, let me see. Sometimes the class can. And I'll see you next time. <laughs> okay, everyone. Bye-bye. Compass Publishing. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's John Edwards here. I hope you enjoyed the last uh, presentation. 
uh, with Eric. Um, welcome to another presentation by me. This is the presentation about teaching grammar. Um, I'm going to be going for about uh, 50 minutes approximately. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always leave them in the, uh, in, the, uh, chat, in the chat and I'll check them periodically. Or we'll have about five minutes at the end of the presentation to, uh, to talk about questions as well. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and uh, get something out of it. And uh, let's have some fun. So my presentation is called uh, Teaching Grammar from Drills to Automaticity. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, some background, just about why we're teaching grammar, and uh, you know a little bit about some of the some of the basic concepts. Then we're going to talk about different approaches to teaching grammar, and um, how to present new structures, and how to practice new structures. And then I'll give you a kind of typical lesson flow. We can talk about the different parts of the lesson, and. Then uh, we'll talk about how to correct errors with grammar uh, in a grammar lesson. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about um, the New Frontier series and how we approach grammar in that series. So let's, uh, let's begin. So just a little bit of background, first of all. So I mentioned this word automaticity in the, uh, the first, at the beginning of the presentation. So what do we mean by auth uh, automaticity? So if you think about how you, um, how you speak your mother tongue, so usually you're not, I would say, you're never thinking about grammar. You're never thinking, planning your sentences and thinking, oh, I need to use present perfect here, or I need to use simple past here. You're not thinking about grammar at all. The language just comes out automatically. And even more than that, if somebody says the beginning of a sentence and stops in the middle, you probably know what part of speech comes next and what you can kind of anticipate the structure without even thinking about it. So this is what we mean by automaticity, this kind of internalized, uh, natural, generative uh, ability to produce language without really thinking about it. So that's the kind of the goal that we're aiming for. As, as teachers. And how to get there is the hard part. So, you know, for m most language teachers, we, we think that, um, you know, teaching grammar in an explicit way is an important thing. But is this how your students react when you say, oh, we're going to have a grammar lesson today? They look bored and they yawn. So, right away, students have a kind of negative reaction to grammar and why is that you know we should think about that as a teacher why do our te do our students have this kind of reaction to grammar could it be maybe we're approaching it in the wrong way so let's think about how you would teach present perfect so present perfect is notoriously uh, a difficult um, grammar structure to teach because it's quite complicated and it doesn't exist in some languages, like some languages that don't share a lot of the same history as English. Um, they don't have a present perfect tense, so it's very hard to teach. Like I teach a lot of Korean students and present perfect does not exist in, in uh, Korean, so it's a very hard concept for them to kind of grasp. So how would you teach it? So here's one possibility. This is something that I found on the internet. So this, this lesson, you know, maybe if you present this on the board with the, the, the form, you know, you can teach them, oh, it, you use the present, present simple of has, either has or have, plus the past participle. And we're talking about something that happened in the recent past in, uh, in a time period that's not finished yet. And it has these different functions, like it's for dur the duration from the past until now. And it's about an event in the past at an unspecified time. And you can kind of go through all the rules. There's five different rules there. We can, we can explain and give examples of each of them. And then maybe we could follow that up with some, some uh, written exercises and then some drills. But the problem is your students already gave up. 
Your students have already gotten lost. They've already given up. So what is the problem? What is the difficulty with this kind of lesson? It's true. All the information that we're presenting is true, and it's very accurate. It's, you know, we're, we're explaining all of the information very completely also. But the problem is it's not age appropriate. We're, we haven't taken in, into consideration the age of our students. And it's probably not level appropriate also. The reason is the language that we're using to explain the grammar, the grammar point is actually above the level of the, the students. Maybe we have to use words like past participle. We have to use words like period of time. And students at that, the level that we're teaching may not be familiar with those kinds of terms. Also, it's not really useful to, to list all of those different rules and to kind of bombard them with a lot of uh, information at the beginning of the lesson. It's not, an, not a manageable amount of information to kind of internalize and digest. And also, we're not teaching the, the grammar point with context. We're not teaching, teaching it in a kind of useful context where they can see what's where, where it's used and why it's used. So we can probably guess that in this kind of lesson, the students won't really acquire the structure. Here, acquire means be able to use it kind of naturally in a, in a, in a, in a conversation in, in their normal daily life. So that's the problem. How about something different like this? What if we presented the, pro the, uh, the new structure like this? So I've been traveling around the world for a long time, for a few years, and I've been to lots of different countries. I've had the, uh, the great pleasure to visit Brazil and China and Germany and Mexico and Cambodia and Peru. So I've been to those countries. I've been to Brazil. Have you been to Brazil? We could ask our students like this. So this is a very kind of more, it, it presents a context right away. So why, why would this be a better way to present the grammar point? Because it's a manageable chunk. We're dealing with just one use of present perfect. We're just dealing with um, present perfect for experience, not all of them. We're not, not talking about all of the different uses. We're just talking about one chunk of grammar. And the language that I'm using is very controlled. We're not using any, um, any grammatical meta-language, no, no jargon, so they can practice the form without knowing a lot of different past participles, without knowing a lot of jargon as well. Also, right away, it's contextualized. That means we're, I'm using the structure for real communication, and it's not just mechanical. I'm, I'm telling them about my real experience, and we're using the structure to, to communicate. And most importantly, there's no grammatical, grammatical um, meta-language. I don't have to talk about past participle. I don't have to talk about period of time. I don't have to talk about all of these things. So the, the students can intuit and use the meaning, the, the form, from the context. So that's just a little bit of background, and, and now let's talk about some different approaches to teaching grammar. So if we think about the evolution of ELT approaches, we can talk about everything from the grammar translation method, which was the sort of original, original form of, uh, of language teaching, where you teach the grammar rules and you translate from the person's uh, mother tongue. And then we had things like the Berlitz method, where there, and audio, uh, audio lingua method, where there's a lot of drill practice, a lot of repetition, um, to things that are more sort of the humanistic period during the 1970s and 80s. And then we had things like the silent way and communicative language teaching and the natural approach that are more recent, that focus more on, you know, that abandon, almost completely abandon uh, grammar teaching. Um, explicit grammar teaching and focus more on communication tasks. So there's been a real kind of pendulum shift away from grammar teaching to more, you know, communicative language teaching with almost no grammar. So it kind of comes and goes. 
So we can think of instruction as, as being on a kind of continuum, the instruction continuum, where um, on one extreme we have more instruction, more explicit grammar instruction, where the focus is on learning, learning the grammar structure and classroom content, and we're teaching grammar rules and doing drills, and there's a lot of focus on correction, and it's very form-focused and accuracy-focused. That's one extreme. Whereas on the other extreme, where we're looking at more sort of communicative teaching, the focus is more on acquisition and more like natural or authentic content and exposing the students and immersing the students in the language and giving them lots and lots of comprehensible input, and it's more meaning-focused and fluency-focused. So these are sort of the two extremes. And if we think about how grammar would be taught in those different extremes, you know, in the, in the uh, very instruction-focused or instru the more instruction model, it would be more like a grammar-based lesson where, where the aim is to learn the grammar point. So we would do things like presenting the learning point, even possibly using their mother tongue, the L1. We would do lots of grammar exercises and we would practice the grammar in context. That would be sort of the flow of the lesson, sort of like that first lesson that I showed you at the beginning. Whereas in a more, um, in a less uh, instructional m model, we would use more like contextualized language. So the aim would be to use the language communicatively. That would be the aim. So we would present the language the, or the structure in context. We would practice it in context. And we would produce it in context. That's sort of what we talk about as the typical PPP uh, lesson. Present, practice, produce. So when we talk about context, what do we mean? We mean a synthesis, a kind of combination of the form, like how is this, this, the, the grammar point structured, and the meaning, what does it mean, and how do we use it, what kind of context, is, to context do we use it in, and what's the purpose of this grammar structure. So instead of explaining all of those things, we could explain it like we did at the beginning of the presentation, or we could just show it. So by showing the, the structure in a context, we actually just show the form, the meaning, and the use very intuitively. We can think of it like this. You, you, know, you could explain to someone what watermelon tastes like. You could say, oh, it's very juicy, and it tastes sweet, and it has this kind of you know, fruity vegetable taste. But they're not going to understand what that means. But if we actually give them a piece of watermelon, they'll get it right away. They'll understand it right away. So in the same way, by presenting contextualized language, by showing them the structure in context, what we're doing is we're teaching them the form, the meaning, and the use in a very direct way, in a very intuitive way, just like getting them to taste the watermelon. We don't have to explain it. Just let me get some water, sorry. Okay, presenting new structures. So we talked about PPP, right? Present, uh, produce, and present, practice, produce. So this is the present part. So presenting new structures. So we can talk about two basic approaches to presenting new structures. One is called the deductive approach. And in the deductive approach, what we're doing is we're moving from rule to examples. So explain the rule first. So maybe I could teach something like this. We put so in front of an adjective, and we put such in front of a article, adjective, noun combination. And then we present examples. So we could say something like, uh, it was so embarrassing. She's such a nice person. We can show the examples after we explain the rule. And then we can get them to practice. We could say, OK, I'll give you a prompt like test plus difficult, and I want you to produce the structure. The test was so difficult, or it's such a difficult test. So explaining the rule, moving to presenting examples, and then getting them to practice. So this is what we call the deductive approach. 
In contrast to that, we could have the inductive approach where we teach, um, we present uh, examples in context, like we mentioned before. We present a, a context and we, that includes examples of the structure that we're teaching. From that, we can elicit the rule. Elicit here means get the students to guess. Maybe the teacher needs to guide this. They need to guide this process by asking some questions. So for example, I could present this, this um, little story as a context. Yesterday, something happened. I was so tired. It was such a warm day, so I fell asleep in class. It was so embarrassing. But my classmate woke me up. She's such a nice person. So there's lots of examples of the structure in the context. But maybe we could elicit the rule and we could do that by asking some questions. So we could say, if you find the word so in the passage, what comes after so? Maybe you can see, see so tired or so embarrassing. So there's an adjective after, the, after so. And what comes after such? So such has maybe such a nice person or such a warm day. So we can, we can get the students to find the rule themselves. Then we can do the practice. Okay, so we have these two different approaches. We have the deductive approach where it's very rule-driven learning. We teach the rule, then we get them to, um, to practice the rule based on that. And then there's the inductive approach where it's more like noticing. We get the students to notice the rule and raise their awareness of the rule. So the deductive approach might be faster and it might require some grammar jargon. We might have to use their mother tongue to teach it because they won't understand the jargon. And it's very teacher-centered. It's very like the, from the teacher, the teacher knows the knowledge and they're conveying it to the student. Whereas the inductive approach, it might be slower, might take more time to kind of unpack the passage, find the examples, ex ex elicit the rule. That's going to take longer. There's going to be more um, class time. But the students might understand it better. They might have that kind of aha moment, that eureka moment. And it's more student-centered. They're going to remember it better also. So it's kind of some pros and cons to both methods. But as we saw at the beginning of the, uh, the presentation, the deductive approach might not be uh, so effective. We have to control the amount of content that we teach. We have to uh, you know, limit how much, um, how much jargon we use. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but certainly there are pros and cons to both of them. Here's some other ways of uh, presenting, presenting uh, a structure in context. So we could use uh, personal anecdotes or stories from our own life, kind of like I did when I was talking about my travels. We could bring in realia uh, into the classroom, real things. We could bring a newspaper. We could bring uh, a hair dryer and talk about, talk about what it does. Depends on the grammar structure we're teaching. We could use minimal sentence pairs, generative situation. We're going to talk about those in a second. We could use a written text, um, like I did with uh, so and the so and such example. We could describe pictures or videos. We could get the students to do a dialogue or a play. Or we could use a news story or a weather report. So depending on the different um, structure that you're using, any of these methods might be uh, useful ways to, to present the, the, um, the new structure in a context. So here's an example. This is a generative situation. So let's say, uh, continuing on from our uh, present perfect lesson, I could say, oh, look, these, the, these two friends haven't seen each other for you know, 10 years. Emily and, and Susan, they meet on the street. Oh, hi, Susan. And, what kinds of things have happened in the last 10 years? Maybe Susan is going to tell Emily about the things that have happened. Let's think of some examples that she might say. I've gotten married. I've bought a car. I've bought a house. I have a, I've, I've bought a dog. So she, we could generate 
all of this language out of this situation. So again, depending on the structure that you are, are trying to present, you can come up with different um, generative situations that, that will elicit those kinds of uh, structures. And just one little tip for using generative situations, I would say practice on your own. You know, come up with the situation before class and try to generate examples on your own. If, you, if you're stuck after two or three examples, then it's probably not going to work and you need to come up with another situation. So here's another example using um, minimal sentence pairs, again with uh, present perfect. I could show these two contrasting sentences and elicit from the students what the difference is. So if I say, for example, I lost my phone and I have lost my phone. So in the first case and the second case, what is the difference? I lost my phone. The feeling is kind of like it's finished. The situation is finished. I've given up, my phone is gone. But if I say, I have lost my phone, the feeling is more immediate. It's more still open. I'm still looking for my phone. I haven't given up. So this can show you how present, uh, present, pa uh, present perfect has this kind of connection with the present, whereas simple past, it's finished. It's a finished period of time. Another example, Charles Dickens wrote many books. Stephen King has written many books. What's the difference between these two people? Well, why do we use simple past to talk about Charles Dickens? Because he's dead. He's not alive anymore. So again, this can show you present perfect means um, present perfect means the situation is still continuing and there can be more books by Stephen King because he's still alive. That's why we use present perfect. Whereas Charles Dickens is dead, so we use simple past because he can't write any more books. So that's um, generative situations and minimal sentence pairs as ways to present, um, to present grammatical structures in a more meaningful and contextualized way. So how to practice new structures. So we, have, we can think about sort of three different um, types of activities or types of exercises that we can get students to do in order to practice, um, practice new structures. So one is uh, recognition exercises. These are very simple exercises and they don't seem like they're really teaching something to the students. But the purpose is to get them to r raise their awareness and to see the structure in a context. So the purpose here is to get students to pay attention to a grammar structure in context, and they're important for raising awareness of students. So an example would be, uh, listen to a passage, listen to me read a passage, and just put up your hand every time you hear so, or every time you hear simple past, or every time you hear present perfect. Or read a passage and underline or circle the present perfect. Very simple. Um, type of act activity, but it's important, especially as a first step. Then we can kind of, um, in terms of practice activities, we can categorize them into two types. One is restricted use practice, and the other one is authentic use practice. So restricted use practice is more like, it's also known as mechanical or very controlled use and the, the main point is to drill the students to get them to repeat many times the key structure and to pay attention to the form. So the, the aim is accuracy, the, the focus is on accuracy. So we could do things like substitution drills or transformation drills. There's, it's not meaningful at all, it's just repetition of the structure. So that doesn't mean it's bad, it's very, it's, it's good to kind of build that um, you know, build the, 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 that uh, rep, the structure into their, basically we're creating pathways in their, in their brain to be able to produce that structure without thinking about it. So lots of drill practice, just like when you're learning 
the piano, you have to play the scale many times. And it's not beautiful music, but by playing the scale many times, you get your fingers used to playing those keys in a certain order, and you build up that pathway in your, in your brain to be able to control your hand in a certain way. In the same way, we get the students to um, do these drills over and over again to build those pathways in their brain. The, uh, the other type of grammar practice is called authentic use practice. This is more meaningful and we're, we're aiming to get them to use the structure to produce or to exchange meaning. So the focus is on communication and this is, um, in the process of, of doing this, the students are going to learn how the structures are used in a certain context. They're going to kind of build that feeling or that kind of automatic recognition. So when that situation comes up in real life, they're going to know um, which structure to use kind of intuitively. So we, both of those things are important. Restricted use builds that familiarity with the structure, with the form. And authentic, authentic use builds the familiarity with the situation or the, the, the practical use. So restricted use activities, like those kinds of drill-like activities, they might be boring, um, not interesting for students, but they're important to develop accuracy and automaticity. That means like producing without thinking, producing the, the structure without thinking. So, Repetition, rep, repetitive oral drills like listen and repeat. You could say like, uh, let's practice the present perfect. I'll give you the subject and a verb. I want you to just make the present perfect sentence. Like, I gone, I go, then they can say, I have gone, or I, uh, he wrote, write, he has written. They can just do this kind of very repetitive drill or substitution drills like the form, uh, form the same structure with slight changes in the content, or doing written exercises like a, like a worksheet or grammar activities or grammar games. Authentic use activities are things where students, are activities where students express their own ideas and talk about their own experience so it's more personalized and it's more about expressing meaning these, are, these should always include things like um, information gaps, so that means one student has information and the other student is lacking information, so they have to exchange uh, some ideas. It should also include choice. The students should have a free choice about what to talk about. And there should be some kind of feedback, like if they're talking, about, talking to a student, there should be opportunities for the, the other student to ask them questions, for example, or respond to their uh, respond to what they say. This is how we develop um, conversation strat speaking strategies. So this develops uh, fluency and as I said it also develops their familiarity with the, the use or the purpose of the structure. So things like examples include things like interviewing, role-playing, problem-solving, group discussions, things like this. So here's a typical grammar lesson flow. So we would have a start with a warm up. This presents the students with the prepare the students for the lesson and generate interest in the topic and activate their schema or their prior knowledge and review any kind of known language, language they might have already covered in a previous lesson. Then we move on to the presentation stage where we're introducing the new language structure and as we as we mentioned before Context is very important, so presenting the, presenting the structure within a context, within a meaningful context. So I talked about my travel experience, or you could talk about a story, or you could present them with a picture and talk about it. Provide meaningful listening and reading input, and the goal is to focus the student's attention on the new structure and to help them gain general understanding of it. So that could maybe start with one of those recognition activities that we, we talked about before, like find and circle the present perfect, or put up your hand when you hear the present perfect. Then we move on to the practice stage, starting with restricted use practice. So the students would manipulate the structure and internalize what they're learning 
to develop some kind of proficiency with it or develop automaticity with the, just with the form of the structure. So we would guide the practice with some scaffolding. So scaffolding here means some support. So maybe like a sentence starter or like a substitution table, this kind of thing. There's some comments in the, in the, in the uh, chat room. I'm just going to talk about them in one second. Um, when we're doing restricted use um, activities, we want to make sure that we do error correction to focus on, on accurate production of the new structure. And this, the whole purpose here, even though it's not real me meaningful co communication, it's that kind of that drill practice prepares them for real communication. It gets them familiar with the structure so they don't have to think too much about how to make the structure when they move on to real uh, communicative, uh, authentic use. Then we move on to the application part of the, uh, the uh, lesson where they're actually using the structure to uh, ex express their own meaning. So they, you shouldn't move on to this stage until you feel your students are kind of comfortable or confident in producing the structure itself. So once they know, for example, they know how to produce um, the present perfect, they're, they're um, producing it correctly most of the time, then they can move on to using it to produce their own meaningful communication. So this kind of context should be personalized and as realistic as you can make it within the, the limitations of the classroom. And it really helps a lot if you can get students to communicate with each other. The purpose here is that you want to uh, get them to speak as much as possible. And if you're doing just whole class activities, um, they're not going to be producing as much language as if you pair them up or put them in a small group to, uh, to communicate. Also during this phase, we should minimize error correction. The purpose here is to get them to communicate as much as possible, to practice using the structure. So we should minimize the error correction in order to get them to feel comfortable expressing their, their meaning. There's some comments in the, the, the chat room. It says, I think it depends on students if, uh, can, you, can you move the chat room over a little bit? Okay, I, I can't read the comments right now, but I'll, I'll move, I'll just move it over again. Hold on one second. That's okay. We'll talk about them after. So the next, uh, the next stage is, uh, the final stage of a grammar lesson would be to extend. So extension means giving them some kind of uh, communicative activity to, to practice and apply the uh, structure for um, additional practice and to enrich and consolidate their learning. So this is going to ex ex expand or extend their uh, communication for the real world. Just a little note about um, error correction. Kinchen, Just a little note about error correction. So we definitely don't want our students to feel um, like this when they're being corrected. We don't want them to feel like they've done something wrong, like they should feel ashamed or um, you know, it's not like making a math, math mistake. So one way we can do this is by um, maintaining a very positive attitude towards, towards errors. I always say to my students, errors are, if you make a mistake, it means you have something to learn. It means there's an opportunity to learn something. So don't feel bad about making mistakes. So as teachers, we need to uh, think carefully about how much we correct and, and how we correct and also when we correct. The, perp the reason is if we correct too much, we're going to create reluctance. What does that mean? That means your students are going to be um, 
unlikely to want to participate. They're going to want to, uh, you know, they're going to be shy. They're going to become shy and scared to participate in class if you correct them too much. But if you don't correct them enough, we're going to end up with fossilization of errors. That means um, the errors become a habit. They become um, a, a speaking habit. The students always make the same mistakes over and over again. And the problem with those kinds of habits is it, it can become very difficult to, to fix those later. So once those, um, those errors become entrenched or fossilized, um, it can become difficult to fix them. So we, do, we want to avoid that by correcting at the right time and the right amount. So it's important to align the error correction with the pe pedagogical goal of the activity. So that means when we think about the part of the lesson that we're doing, what, it, what is the objective of that part of the lesson? Is the objective accuracy? Do we want to focus on, for example, we've, we've introduced a new, a new um, structure. We're getting them to do drill practice. Do we want to uh, make sure that they're using that correctly so that we build the, the familiarity with the structure? If that's the case, then we should offer more correction. If the focus is on accuracy, like immediate and uh, immediately we should correct any mistakes that they've made with that structure. So we should focus on the key structure and we could get, should get students to correct themselves. Um, that's going to be much more effective. So pointing out the mistake to them and then getting them to correct it themselves. Oh, that wasn't right. Um, you know, what should you have said? That's much more effective than just giving them the answer. So immediately Focus, uh, immediately correcting errors with the structure if the focus is on accuracy. But if the focus is on fluency, we should correct less. The, 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 if the focus is on uh, fluency um, and just meaningful communication or authentic communication, we should allow that communication to happen. And we should only, um, only correct immediately when it interferes with communication. If there's a breakdown in communication, they're not able to get their point across, or there's been some kind of misunderstanding, then we should correct. They should correct them. Otherwise, you know, as we're circulating around the, circulating around the room, then we should uh, take note. We should have a notepad in our hand, and we should write down the errors that we hear and then we should do some kind of group feedback after the activity. That's going to be much more effective. Still, we can get them to correct themselves, but we don't want to inf uh, interfere with the, uh, the communication. Guillermo asks, should we teach grammar for college students um, or have them to discover? So I think in, in all cases, uh, discovery learning is going to be a more, myself, I think it's more effective. It's a more effective way to teach. But you, sh you need to um, build up your familiarity as a teacher. You need to get comfortable teaching like that. And you need to get your students comfortable uh, with that kind of format of, of the lesson. So I think it's not about the age of the students. It's more about your competency as a teacher and your familiarity with the the necessary uh, teaching methods. So a little, a few tips about um, error correction. So when you're giving error correction or when you're giving feedback, you can talk about what they did wrong, but also what they did right. What kind of good, you know, when you're going around listening to the students, you can write down some great sentences that you heard. Like, uh, you know, oh, I heard somebody said this sentence and isn't it great? You know, it, it's very, somebody made a really great sentence. That's going to boost their confidence. Also, maintain a positive attitude towards errors. Like we talked about before in your classroom, you should never make students feel like they've done something wrong. That's not the point of error correction. The point of error correction is to teach them, to show them, to guide them towards accurate production. Um, 
Again, keep the pedagogical goals and the key structures in mind. That's what you should be focusing on, either fluency or accuracy, and always correct the mistakes in the key structure that you're teaching. Sometimes you might also need to correct other things, but try to minimize those. The reason is um, we don't want to cloud the water. We don't want to make um, students focus on too many things at the same time. We want them to focus on accurate production of the structure that, that we're, we're trying to teach them. And engage students to correct themselves. As I mentioned, that's going to be much more effective than just giving them the correct answer. Important things not to do, don't single out your students in front of their peers. Don't say, you know, oh, Jinu said this, and look at this mistake he made. We never want to do that. We never want to single out students in front of the class. One way to avoid that is to, um, you know, when you're circulating around the classroom, you can, um, if they're doing pair work or small group work, then you can give them error correction directly. But if you're doing a whole class um, you know, uh, error correction session, you can just write the, pass the uh, error that you heard up on the board and not mention any names. Just say, I heard this sentence, how can we correct it? Marivelle says, yes, make error correction a learning experience for everyone. Yes, exactly. This correcting method is much better for communicative approaches, definitely. And another important uh, point to make about error correction, don't interrupt the flow of communication, especially when the focus is on, um, on authentic use activities, on fluency building. And have the students rep repeat the corrected version. So after they correct it themselves, you can say, OK, everybody, let's say it out loud and get them to all uh, say the correct sentence. So that's my presentation about uh, error correction. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, New Frontiers which uh, is our um, English course, course book series for teenagers. And it goes from a beginner to upper intermediate level. So it's a six level ELT course book for secondary school learners. And I think the covers are very beautiful. Actually, this is one thing I really like about the, uh, this course book. The design is amazing. I think our designer did a really good job. So, there's six levels, and they go from uh, A1 level to B2 level. And they feature a 10-unit structure with uh, the lessons. Uh, each lesson group of lessons is structured around a theme and, uh, and some common goals. And there's a balance of input and output and all four language skills. So one thing I'm going to show you later is um, all four language skills have a separate lesson for each one. So you can be sure that there's going to be equal attention spent on um, writing and listening and speaking and, and reading. There's a clear focus on building CEFR competencies. So we actually referred to um, the CEFR competencies themselves when we were just designing the course book series. And they're thematically linked to 21st century skills. Um, there's a project in every unit. So they're going to practice their critical thinking, communication, creative thinking, and collaboration. And as I mentioned, there's a very nice design, bold design, and entertaining comics and animations as well for students. So I'll just give you a very brief uh, walkthrough of, of a unit. And I'll kind of point out some of the places where we teach grammar and how we approached grammar teaching in the series. So each unit starts with this kind of bold, uh, colorful, and interesting photo for the two students to kind of lead into the, uh, the unit. So in this case, you see a girl helping her mom cook. And you can talk about that with the students. And the purpose there is to kind of lead into the, the theme or the, the topic of the unit. And all of the uh, objectives are also listed on the, uh, on the first page there. You can also see there's a little QR code. 
So this, this means that you scan this code to get all of the audio for the whole unit. So it's very convenient for teaching. So this is a typical uh, lesson. So it, each lesson is, has um, a target uh, language skill that they're focusing on. So in this case, it's listening. And the aim is, um, the aim is listed right at the top of the, the, uh, the page there. So in this case, they're going to talk about understanding likes and dislikes. So they start with uh, vocabulary learning. So they go through uh, just a simple listen and number activity. And then we actually point out a feature of the vocabulary. So in this case, there's a little note about, you know, some of the nouns end with S and some of them don't. Why is that? So we're actually teaching them uh, count and non-count nouns in a very uh, contextualized way. Then there's a simple listening activity where they hear the words in context. They hear them s said and they have to just um, write down the word that they're talking about. Then there's a focus section where we um, give them a, a, a small dialogue pair to, to practice with their, their partner. And the purpose here is to kind of get them, get them used to the structure and get them kind of practicing the structure in preparation for the listening activities. Then we get into the more complicated listening, the longer listening passages. In this case, they're going to listen to four people talking about food in different contexts, and they have to write down the context that, that it's being, uh, that they hear it in. So it could be at a restaurant, in a kitchen, on a picnic, or in the garden. They're going to hear um, the speakers at, in those contexts talking about different foods, things they like, things they don't like, and they have to just write down the context. And then they have to listen for more specific words. And then they're listening for the key, the key point of the, the, the dialogue. So in this case, what is the speaker actually talking about? What is it that they like or what they don't like? So we kind of narrow down from the context to specific vocabulary and then to the message. And then we know that a lot of classrooms have uh, mixed level students. So it's not a consistent level of the students. So we wanted to make sure that each lesson also includes a more challenging um, element as well. So we have this uh, challenge section. It's going to be a little bit longer, a little bit more uh, natural, authentic language. But it's going to have the same kind of learning points and the same kind of uh, basic structure that they've already gotten familiar with. So it's in order to, to challenge those more those more um, comfortable, those students that are more comfortable with uh, the language already. So then we take the students through uh, the other skills as well. So there's a reading section. So in this case, it's all about, uh, again, exposing them to more countable and non-countable nouns. In this case, talking about um, getting, getting them ready to do a reading about street food. So they have a pre-reading activity where they generate um, discussion about what they already know about these, uh, th these types of food. And then they read all about uh, street food in different parts of the world. So there's Peru, ceviche in Peru, one of my favorites, and halo halo in the Philippines and guabao in China. And then there's a reading comprehension activity and then there's personalization activity at the end. So we take them through all four skills, and we are gradually expanding the, the, on the, the grammar structures. So they've already learned the basic concept of, um, all, already learned the basic concept of countable and non-countable nouns. Now we start introducing it in other types of uh, expressions. So in this case, they're going to learn about speaking for ordering in a restaurant, and they're going to use countable and non-countable nouns in the context of those expressions. So we give them uh, a range of different expressions that they can use for ordering, and this time we're teaching them how to um, quantify non-countable nouns. 
So you can see they're learning this, uh, but there's no meta language, there's no jargon that they need to, we're contextualizing it within this, uh, within, within this situation, within these structures. And then they practice in a kind of, in a meaningful way by role playing uh, a situation where they're ordering in the restaurant. So we give them a menu, one of them plays the waiter or waitress and the other one plays the uh, customer and they order. And then throughout the series, we also focus on some uh, more difficult pronunciation, uh, pronunciation issues as well in the speaking sections. And then we also go through writing. So in the writing section, because we're focusing uh, on them, you know, in, in, each, in each unit, we also have at least one uh, lesson where there's explicit grammar instruction as well. So in this case, this, yeah, this one was learning about, sorry, this one was um, explicitly teaching them about um, non -ca count and non-count nouns and how they work within uh, different, different kinds of structures and how to pluralize and how to use them with different exp ex expressions. Then as I mentioned, each uh, unit also has a project uh, lesson. So the project lesson starts by reviewing all of the um, content that they've already learned about different situations, different contexts, different structures, different vocabulary. And the way that we do that is by presenting them with a video. So the video encompasses all of the learning that they've already, uh, they've already gone through in the previous four lessons. And then there's some comprehension activities. They get a little bit more grammar instruction. And then they have the 21st Century Skills Project, which is very communicative. So each one focuses on a separate um, 21st Century Skill, and those are indicated at the top of the activity. In this case, it's about communication and collaboration. Sorry. just catch up with myself here. <laughs> so in terms of the components, uh, the student book, full color workbook, there's a very detailed uh, teacher's guide with uh, class notes, uh, teacher's, teacher talk, expected answers, answer key, and transcripts all embedded. And there's a full range of downloadable material that you can get from our website. There's an answer key, word lists, all of the mp3 audio is available, um, word tests, transcripts for all the listenings, um, tests, a full range of assessments, midterm final unit tests. There's a, also digital components that you can, you can get as well. So this, just in summary, this, focuses, uh, this series focuses on CEFR competencies. It includes 21st century skills instruction, it has project-based learning in every unit. It has a communicative approach. And it has a balance of all four language skills. So that's our series for teens, New Frontiers. So if you want more information about New Frontiers or about any of our ELT products, you can visit our website at compasspub.com. And if you click on, if you search for any of the series, like New Frontiers, you can get sample units from any of them and you can see more information about them. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you found that interesting. I hope you uh, got something out of it and you learn, learned a little bit more about how to, um, how to teach grammar. And I hope uh, you try out some of those techniques and some of those uh, theories in your classroom. Do you have any questions? I guess there's a small lag in the uh, the video, so just I'll just wait for 5 or 10 seconds. Anyways, I guess there aren't any questions, so um, Thank you very much for your attention again, and I hope to see you guys at the next presenta presentation. 
Have a great day.